now SUNY Potsdam, um, and co-author of Lisa Holst. It's especially a pleasure to have Doug to wrap things up talking about the big picture of imperiled fishes across New York State. Thanks. Now I say I'm from Copenhagen, which is in the town of Denmark, not too far from Watertown. But I'm glad to have the affiliation with SUNY Potsdam, and I'm really glad to we're all here for hearing about the, uh, the program. It's, uh, I say it's uh, about some special fish and some special places where they live. Uh, the three pictures are good starting points for the one in the lower left is about the uh, State Wildlife Action Plan, and you'll be hearing more about it. I guess it's not working. It's not working? Yeah, it's good. <laughs> well, thanks. So I've got some terminology and, and topics, and I'm trying hard to avoid acronyms because they're sure easy to get into, but uh, I'll have about three of them, I guess. And, uh, so the terminology with endangered and threatened, I put them together through most of the talk because there's very little difference in their uh, treatment as they're protected, and the classifications are tried to be separate, but it's, it's best to just call everything, if it's endangered or threatened, we call it, I like to call it endangered threatened. And then the third category under this legal uh, grouping is special concern, where these are listed in our law books, or the uh, environmental law books, but there's no protection for special concern. And then the next category of uh, programmatic, or the, the categories that are important for deciding which fish get money to be applied to them, that's the nervous finger for sure. And then imperiled is a term that can mean a lot of different things, whoever's speaking about it. If the Canadians use at risk, and I think that term uh, seems to be more single purpose, but imperil implies that the state program uh, includes those fish. So there's uh, some number of 15 or 30 that are in the imperiled program. And then for the doing of what these programs result in, or the functional part, and you'll be about half the talk will be about the monitoring and the describing and the conserving for these fish. So there's a reclassification process underway. It often takes about a year, and it often comes around about every 20 years. The last one was in 1999, and we're really pleased to know that another one is in progress, and it might be wrapped up by about November of the coming year. Until then, there's this group that are called recommended, and that's what the bottom is about. The 2020 proposal is about 17 species that this category I'm grouping, endangered or threatened. Or you could say endangered and threatened. But there are not much difference in these two lists in total number, but there's sure some differences in the fish. So of those that are no longer, well, I need to say, of those that are now additions to the list on the left is uh, this group of <coughs> some counting here and then be correct to say that there's seven and the ones that we've got in red are the ones that I think there's the most benefit that we'll see. Of course Atlantic sturgeon and paddlefish are important fish but having them be classified uh, if Atlantic sturgeon is federally classified so it's wonderfully protected and iron color shiner um, well let's see iron color shiner is added but it was all already on, on part of the list but these four that are in red, we're really excited to see some programs that might open up for them with the big eye chub and the swallowtail shiner along those sucker and the western subspecies of pirate perch. And I'll be telling you more about these in a minute. Those that are deleted are the really good news, the fish that have shown range expansion. And it's not that we can say there's been activities of the state other than environmental protection that have resulted in their range expansion, but it's really profound how the pug nose shiner is more widespread in the St. Lawrence and the eastern sand darter in the uh, tributaries of the St. Lawrence. They're just uh, in four times as many places as they used to be. And they're uh, doing well with their habitats widespread. The deepwater sculpin of Lake Ontario has had a miraculous reoccurrence that it was thought to be extirpated and now it's really abundant down deep. And the trawls that the USGS brings up that have hundreds of deep water scope and it's about time we got it off the list because uh, fish don't do well bringing, being brought up from deep water and now they're 
no longer threat or endangered and uh, not a complication if you're killing numbers incidental to the collections. So a little more on the jumping across these. Big Eye Chub is in western New York. It's gone from one of the watersheds. It's no longer found in Lake Ontario tributaries. The sh sh Swallowtail Shiner is common in the Atlantic drainages, so the Susquehanna. Uh, we're glad to see it classified because some emphasis can be put on these southern counties or the waters of the Susquehanna, Shemung, and, and Delaware. So now there's a, a threatened species that can be, uh, special programs can be applied to. The long nose sucker is widespread across New York, but still only found in about 40 waters. If you were able to see the poster, I'm so pleased that programs can be directed at the long nose sucker. Pirate perch is pretty common on Long Island, so we specify the western subspecies. And it's in western New York, it can't be found where it used to be in the Braddock Bay vicinity or in the Niagara vicinity. It's gone from those waters, but it's still easily caught in some base of eastern basin of Lake Ontario. And easily caught is kind of a trick because it gets underneath the cattails, and until it's at high abundance, you just it goes undetected. So it's got quite a strange set of life history if I guess after the genus name means that your anus is next to your mouth and so it's really descriptive <laughs> that they can have these Latin names uh, right on target. So the proposed removals, I've spoke a little bit about the Pugno, Shire, and Sand Order as well as the deep water scope. So we'll just zoom on to the special concern and these aren't as powerfully uh, controlled or protected as I said, the endangered and threatened has habitat protection. It's a, a real powerful tool and special concern. Uh, they're just on the watch list, I guess you might say. And there's some, there's a large number added, as you can see, and the most in, influential additions to that list. And, and sometimes you might say the most confusing, as only being classified as special concern, would be the eel. That its declines are so profound in the St. Lawrence, but we, New York, with the broad state that it is has populations on the coast that Long Island has a fishery and it would be inappropriate from many people's point of view for it to be threatened. Other than that, you might say it is threatened in the Great Lakes drainage as Ontario has classified it. The bloater is one of those uh, deep water ciscos that are hard to identify and the Great Lakes consortium of USGS and uh, the Canadians are doing restoration efforts with the bloaters. They've been stocking them, uh, as you'll see in a few minutes, uh, for several years, for maybe six years. And they, the needle in the haystack can't be exaggerated to think that they put these little fish in Lake Ontario and then some can be caught. And indeed, they caught them on two occasions from the initial stockings. Summer sucker, I think most of you are in the room to hear more about it. And we're glad that it's special concern because uh, there needs, we need to understand more about this fish. And the sauger is a, a restoration species I'll be talking about more in a minute. So the, the last of my terminology here is species of greatest conservation need. That's quite a mouthful, and the acronym kind of is even more confusing. But uh, there's 42 fish that are listed in this document that you can see to the left, along with, I think, over 600 other animals of New York that are species of greatest conservation need. So we have about 42 fish. And most of them are in these classifications you've already heard about, threatened, endangered, special concern. But 17 of them are not. And uh, examples down at the bottom. So as I say, the eligible for funds, there could be money spent on all of these 42. And if there's some other fish that's not in this group, it's more difficult for money to be applied to its recovery efforts. So now on to the part of the program that's not terminology, that's more about the activities that have been taking place. Of course, a rare fish program needs to know how rare they are, so you have to do statewide surveys back in the 30s. This is a terrific picture for, with John Greeley, the tall guy, and Rainey on the far side. And then the next picture, the importance to this monitoring and archiving means that you've got, <coughs> oh, oh, I didn't push it. They're going to the museum <coughs> shelf with Ed Rainey picture quite a few years earlier on the far left, and then he's with his collections at Cornell. He uh, stayed at Cornell to the mid-70s and made a terrific legacy of our knowledge of fish. And then to the right are the two Carlsons catching fish in uh, Cranberry Lake, upstream of Cranberry Lake. So this atlas that you've seen pitch, 
available out on the registration table. Uh, people pick something up and how close do they read it? On page seven is the address for where you can get all the records for this fish, these fish that are on the maps. And not many people have asked, did you notice that you can get all of these 500,000 records at your fingertips on an Excel spreadsheet? And as a guy this morning wanted, he bought a fisherman who works here in the hotel, bought one and I said, you know, if you're fishing Sagamore Lake and you want to know all the records, the spreadsheet will just key you right in to know whether when it started having the fish you don't want or how the fish that you do want have only been caught up until a certain point and they aren't caught there any longer. So it's quite a tool that people can get all these records on a, a mega spreadsheet. The second part of the doing is the data collection and interpretation, writing reports. Um, these maps are in the atlas that give you a quick look on the right map that has up units, up 10 units, that shows the red being fish only caught before 1986. So you get a picture that the fish might be on the decline if there's lots of red, as is shown for the long-nosed sucker. And the poster talked about the long-nosed sucker catches after the year 2000 which is a few years later than 1986, and there's a lot more decline. So the, the amount of red here would be increased if we moved that up to 2000. And what's a good interval for saying that you've had enough effort that you can legit legitimately say that it's not in the water anymore? 15 years in our, our big lakes where the long nose sucker have been, uh, they're pretty easy to catch with gill nets, of course, until they get to a lower level. So we know quite a bit about New York's fish with all this data set at our accessibility. <clears throat> describing the special taxa, and I should have added here, describing the special habitats that you can find them in is a really important role that this uh, program covers. And it's, as you can see by all of the affiliated people, it's certainly more than DEC that have been contributing to this with the advances of the summer sucker, as you heard Carl speak of, that we look forward to advances in the next two years, just taking the fog out of our view is what's really going on for these fish. Pug nose shiner, we've had monies from the, <clears throat> from the HERF program, which is compensation for changes caused by Niagara Project, or the pump storage and the, um, the fluctuations in the Niagara, but the money has gone toward better understanding pug nose shiners, except I've got that wrong. Pug nose shiners are in the St. Lawrence, not in Niagara. So the money that has come for northern sunfish came from the Niagara funds, and the St. Lawrence funds took care of pug nose shiners so that we know, about, know more about their habitat relationships. And the bottom is about the northern sunfish disappearance from Tonawanda Creek, probably uh, gone, but below detection is a better word. And the hybridization, uh, Mr. Sanderson reported a few years back on his dissertation on northern sunfish and it, it uh, just touched on the hybridization that's being further described as with the genetics and the morphometrics that are being done. So then about recovery programs, <clears throat> how long have we been stocking fish in these recovery programs? You can see some more than others. And to keep on time, I'll go to where have they been stocked? And this shows a pretty vis visual uh, law avoidance of eastern New York and, and southern New York. Recovery programs have not been applied there. As I spoke of the uh, good wishes that Swallowtail Shiner might get more recovery efforts that it's in the Susquehanna and extending to the Delaware. So there might be more programs in the future. As you might say, that state is, that part of the state is, has not been able to uh, get any programs directed. So some of the, the two highest profile recovery programs have plans that are online as well as uh, the recovery efforts are uh, profound that we've got the fish that were stocked are now able, some are able to be caught as a second generation. And the programs in the future for this imperiled fish program have a five-year plan that it shows that Big Eye Chub, Summer Sucker, and Moon Eye will be gaining the attention in this five-year period. And the bottom half of the slide shows fish that have been getting attention before this five-year period as well as continuing through the five-year period. <clears throat> so monitoring is the foundation of this. If you don't know what's out there, as I like to say, the Tennessee darter issue of all those years ago, they, after it became 
a big deal that the dam wasn't being able to be built. They found that lots of places the fish was found. It just takes lots of people cooperating and a good central storage facility for records to come in. And these are pretty exciting findings from last year, as you can see from a variety of different uh, collaborators. And, and I'm glad for the Ben Carson and uh, Chris Driscoll putting special effort into these these fish that are not at all easy to identify, and the guy sorting the catch in the field, you can say common china, common china, creek jump, and then, ooh, it's a little bit different. And some people will just keep on going, but throwing it in a jar is really essential to having the good database that we need. The approach that has been through all times with endangered species is one species at a time, and at some point, it might gravitate into having uh, more than one species and fish associations and this could be applied well to the southern tier where minnow assemblages are just dramatically changed. There's more invasive species that you wouldn't necessarily think mimic shiner or spot tail shiner, which is a native species is expanding its range at the expense of these others, thus uh, more sensitive species, the swallowtail and comely shiner. So uh, monies that are coming in the future, this RAWA is better spoken as the Recovering America's Wildlife Act, and we hope that it gets advances and, and lots of people need to write to their legislators showing support for it, as it could be money five years from now, and it could be a huge amount of money for programs in New York, probably channeled out to universities and, and contractors uh, to follow, initiate and follow up on recovery programs. So there's the almost final slide, and we're hoping to uh, have people come to a meeting that would be in late April for people particularly interested in, in rare fish programs. And I hope that it will have an outdoor component. It's likely to be in Rome, New York, and yeah. you all get a ticket to Rome. <laughs> I don't know what we can catch there, salty water. Uh, this program is being planned, and if we get 20 people to be interested, we'll kind of have a closer review of some of these findings, like the what does it mean to have a spotted guard be caught? Or what are the prospects of there being some fish assemblage studies, more effort applied to the downstate part of New York? The extirpated fish, the mud sunfish, would be a good candidate for some recovery efforts. It's, it's easily found in New Jersey, and we just have such a tiny part of our state with that same kind of habitat, and it's been gone as you would expect. Anything next to the Tappan Zee Bridge was gone a long time ago. And, um, so if, if you're interested in joining in with this, some way get your email address to me, and we'll uh, let you know what's being planned, and we'll try to have a date that works for the majority of the people. And thanks to particularly to Lisa Holston administrating this program for all these years. The part of going out and catching fish, of course, to me, is what I could keep doing. But someone keeping the reins on the program in the Albany uh, arena is, is so important. These other collaborators, the State Museum has done a wonderful job, but not many states have a sister agency like this where they'll take the fish, they'll tell you what it is. I went, went, once went to a fish identification course in Toronto and I was so lucky that Crossman was there. And I asked him, how much does it cost if OMNR people send you a jar of fish? And it was like $40 a fish. And to identify them and archive them if they chose. But we've got this New York sister agency taking any fish we send them very good spirited about it. Uh, other collaborators, Scott Schluter, sure gave me a lot of encouragement for this presentation and the prospects of this meeting that we'll have a host of uh, people out, I hope, in, in April, and then these other folks. So uh, I'd like to let, let go over questions. Okay. You have a few minutes.